Hey, what's up everyone? I have some big news on my end. I'm getting married in a couple days, and as is customary, I need to make gifts for my groomsmen. After mulling it over a little, I decided that I wanted to use the mill to make something out of metal because these guys have been really solid friends, and a couple of them are a bit dense. Okay, that was rough. No more puns or mushy details until the end of the video where I have some footage of the wedding day. I ended up creating this unique bottle opener which I personalized for each of the guys. It's quite hefty, but feels great in the hand. While relatively simple to manufacture, I had to use 3D tool pass to get this nice taper down from the handle to the bottle opening part. The size of the chamfer on the perimeter also tapers off on the slope down, and that was accomplished through using a scallop toolpath and a ball mill. I'm going to dive into how I machine this part and the steps needed to consistently make 10 of these with the use of soft jaws. But first, I've enjoyed using this bottle opener so much so I created a small Etsy listing linked below that you can purchase one for yourself or a friend. With my current setup, they are time consuming to make and therefore are a bit expensive. It's better to think of it as a functional collector's item, Dr. D Flow's first ever product. I will use the proceeds for some high density fixtures as well as some mill upgrades. Definitely an enclosure and probably a tool changer, which should make some great video content and facilitate additional products. But let's take a look at the cam side of things. Milling this bottle opener is a two step operation where I machine the front and then flip it and machine the back side. My stock material is a three quarter inch thick by one and a half inch wide 6061 aluminum bar that I had in hand. The origin for all the subsequent operations are in the top left corner of the stock material. It's important that the stock material is accurately probed into place because it is only 0.04 inches or about one millimeter larger than the bottle opener. My Hallmark digitizing probe makes quick but precise work of finding the corner. Before we get into the tool pass, I wanna recognize that a lot of my viewers have experience with 3D printing, but not necessarily subtracted manufacturing, and hence you may not be familiar with computer-aided manufacturing or CAM programs. But slicers like Cura or Simplify 3D are CAM programs. They generate machine code, specifically G-code, for running 3D printers. The difference between complex CAM programs like Fusion is that most slicers only allow for high-level planning of the printing process. You can tell the slicer to start the extruder on the perimeter of each layer and work inwards or vice versa, but you can't tell it the exact position to start. In many, if not all cases, you don't need this fine level of control for 3D printing. But with CNC milling, where there are many different types of tools that can be used, some of which can be plunged directly into the material and others which can only cut with their sides, programming the exact positioning of these tools is very important. Fusion gives you all the granular control that you need through tabs and tabs of parameters all of which inform the final tool path. This may seem overwhelming for the beginner, but there are many tutorials both on YouTube and Autodesk website, the company behind Fusion 360. With that said, this will just be a quick overview of the tool paths I picked to get the job done to demystify the process. There are many different combinations of tool paths that can be strung together to get to the final part. Some may be faster than others. The first step is to clear out the hole for where the bottle opener will go. This is performed with a normal 2D adaptive clearing path. Adaptive here just means that the program will attempt to keep the material removal constant. You can probably imagine that when this square end mill goes into a corner, its chip load would greatly increase if it took a direct route. This could lead to tool breakage. The way the mill is backing out and then re-engaging in the corner is making sure that the tool doesn't attempt to bite off more than it can chew. The next tool path is a 3D adaptive clearing to form that taper from the handle to the bottle opener. Typically, I think of a 3D tool path as one where the cutter is moving in all three dimensions during the entire length of the cut. But if we zoom in here, you can see that besides the red helical spiral downs, the blue lines, which represent a majority of the material removal, are all contained within a couple Z planes. This is what you would call a 2.5D process. You remove material at one height and step down to the next height and repeat the process. Fusion's 3D adaptive clearing means that it will be mindful of the entire model, unlike a 2D path which removes all the material contained within its boundaries. You can see here that a 2D adaptive clearing path would decapitate the part. Not good. Here the 3D path recognizes the slope and carefully avoids it. The cutter will come back and take some smaller steps next to the slope to approximate it. This is just a roughing operation and we can get a much closer approximation with a ball mill. But first, I want to finish all the other tool paths that use the 6mm square end mill so that I can change tools as infrequently as possible. 
A second 2D adaptive clearing path reveals the top of the tooth, which is the part that will wedge itself below the cap and when elevated will pop the cap off. Two 2D contour paths that trace the perimeter of the part pull the shape of the bottle opener out of the stock material. The first contour is a roughing pass where it steps down a couple millimeters after each pass. The second contour occurs at the final depth and removes the small amount of material left behind, leaving a very smooth wall. A problem with this stock material is that it was too short to cut the entire depth of the perimeter without cutting the jaws of my vise. When I flip the part for the backside operation, I'm going to have to be careful to align everything so the same contour operation on the backside blends in with these current contour operations. For longer production runs, I will buy thicker stock material because even a small mismatch between the front and backside contours will leave a tangible ledge on the entire perimeter of the part. Like seriously, you can easily feel a 1,000th or 25 micron difference and it's quite annoying. I will talk about this a little more when I flip the part. The tool marks left behind from the clearing operation are a bit chaotic, so it's best practice to clean those up with a tool path like this parallel one. I should have faced the part at the beginning, but it slipped my mind. I will clean up that top surface now. I love my two inch shear hog for facing. It can give the part a nice haircut while still leaving a awesome surface finish. For those of us who have a mill or router that is confined to three axes, a ball mill is your best friend for 3D tool paths. The ball mill by its very nature does not have any corners, so it won't leave sharp steps in the material as its Z height is changed. Now don't get me wrong, a ball mill will still leave scallops behind adjacent cuts, but these small peaks of material can be minimized by using smaller stepovers. But clearly the more passes you take, the higher the machining times for the same area. For this reason, if you have a product that requires a lot of 3D tool pass, then a 5-axis mill could drastically speed up production times because instead of using a ball mill to approximate a slope, you could just flip the part to bring that slope into the X or Y axis of the mill and cut it with a flat end mill. But there are many contours that can only be machined with a ball mill, even on a 5 axis. Here the quarter inch ball mill is chugging along at 10 thou or 250 micron step over. I'm still trying to optimize feed times versus finish quality. The parallel tool path keeps the machining marks in the direction of the slope. Next we have this chamfer that goes from large on the handle and then tapers off on the slope. Typically in Fusion you don't actually model your chamfers, you just add it on at the cam step by clicking chamfer and selecting the edges. But because this chamfer is on a 3D geometry and its size changes, I went ahead and modeled it so that I could use a 3D scallop toolpath. Again, scallop is referring to that trench-like path cut by a ball nose cutter. So a ball or bull nose end mill needs to be used for this toolpath. What I love about the scallop is how flexible the toolpath is. I can select the machining boundary to be on either side of the chamfer and it will adjust cutting width to transition from the handle to the bottle opening bit. Now it looks like this is a 2D path based on how the green boundary lines are in the middle of the model, but this toolpath is aware of the 3D model and won't remove necessary material. A small 10 thou or 250 micron step over was also used for this operation. Just to reiterate, that step over is very critical for the finish. I love to watch the ball mill in action. What is interesting is that the spherical geometry is creating flat angular surfaces both for the chamfer now and previously for that slope. But the ball nose can also be used for curved surfaces or really any geometry that can be reached. It is a very versatile tool and any budding machinist should have a couple ball mills in their toolbox. Links below for all the cutters used in this video. Only two more steps left for this side. A two millimeter end mill will clean up the inside of the bottle opener portion and make that tooth more pronounced. I'm using a mill drill to add a small chamfer to that tooth as well as to the inside of the bottle opener. This will relieve stress on that front edge of the tooth and prevent the user from cutting themselves if they carry it by the opener. Now it's time to do the backside. If I got creative, then I could have made the bottle opener gap a probe point for the backside operation, but the large chamfer on the handle means that it will be difficult to get the bottle opener to sit evenly on the parallels and the thin bottle opener portion will be unsupported and free to vibrate as it's being cut. I also have 10 bottle openers, so I need something that is quick, sturdy, and repeatable. What that means, soft jaws. Soft jaws. Thank you, Andy. For this reason, I decided to cut some soft jaws out of these aluminum blanks that I ordered from McMaster Car. The soft jaw will be machined to perfectly conform to the outside perimeter of the part 
and are designed in such a way that there is only one position that the bottle opener can be in when clamped. So I don't have to probe each part. In fact, I don't even have to probe the part, just the soft jaw. In Fusion, I just projected the bottle opener model onto the soft jaws and cut out that area. There is no added tolerance. I did, however, add a large radius where the slope meets the handle because end mills have a tough time reaching tight internal spaces. The spacing between these jaws is set to be the thickness of two parallels, which will be clamped just below the region that will be cut. When the soft jaws are clamped, they will deform a slight amount, and this is the state in which they will be machined. So whenever you probe in your soft jaws, make sure they are clamped to something or else cutting operations from the backside won't match up with those performed on the front. The back left corner on the fixed jaw is the probe point. For a simple geometry like this bottle opener, the soft jaws were easy to make. Just a 2D clearing operation followed up by a 2D contour that gives a nice smooth perimeter. When I place the part into the jaws and tighten it down, the machined half of the bottle opener locates the correct position, which occurs as this V portion squeezes the part. Fortunately, the back side of the part is symmetrical to the front, so it would be redundant to go through all of that footage. However, that last contouring operation is oddly satisfying to watch, especially since there is a very minimal ledge on the perimeter, meaning that we got good registration between the front and back. This is when I knew I hit the jackpot with this design. It's incredibly smooth, has some weight to it, but it's not too heavy. And of course, it accomplishes its primary objective, opening bottles. So to take this gift to the extra step for my groomsmen, I went ahead and engraved their last names. A beefy bottle opener like this needs bold block letters. I used a one millimeter end mill to engrave the names on both sides of the opener. I actually used a 2D adaptive clearing strategy as well as a follow-up 2D contour to get some seriously crisp letters. Definitely overkill, but I'm happy at how the letters stand out. The bottle opener looks great in this machined aluminum finish, but in the future, I plan to test out some anodizing and dyeing. Perhaps a deep black for the serious drinkers out there, and maybe a light orange or blue for the casuals. Cast down, dude. Oh, three, two, one. Wow. Oh, yeah. If everyone would rise for the bride, please. Andrea and David, uh, how they met, they said they met in a lab. <laughs> it's been an experiment this whole time, folks. <laughs> the, the thing that I love about you and every time I've met you is to watch you like with 3D printing and all these things you have in your base. Every, every, every one of these guys knows like your garage is full of toys that we're all like, yes, this is awesome. 
Look at her the way you look at your 3D printers. No. <laughs> Amen. Just kidding. You may kiss your bride. Man, it is so awesome to marry someone who loves you unconditionally and supports you even if you have crazy hobbies. If you don't know, Andy's the one who films most of my content and without her, I would not have been able to restart my YouTube channel in 2020. I'm looking forward to continuing to build our relationship through garage projects, but also normal couple things. I love you, Andy. If you are planning to get married in Middle Tennessee or know someone who is, then I would like to quickly throw in a plug for our photographers, Megan and Tyler, at Encounter Production, who not only captured the thumbnail for this video, but also all the special moments from the wedding. Big shout out to Will McCord for being the videographer and running around with my camera equipment during the ceremony and dances. I would also like to acknowledge Allie Woosley, our florist at Flower Child Nashville, who turned our industrial venue into a beautiful and intimate setting with her floral arrangements. Links for their services below. I'm going to go on a quick honeymoon and I'll be back with some really awesome projects. So get subscribed and thank you guys for all the support. It means a lot to be able to share probably the most important day of my life with you guys.